It's the Super Bowl of, of ultra running. We're surrounded by world-class athletes. As runners, we watch these YouTube videos and stuff on it anyway for guys that we don't even know. Arlen. 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 Hi, I'm Arlen Glick, and I am the guy from Ohio. Just to be at Western States is like a dream of probably thousands of people just to even be here. And the fact that I'm able to even be here at this age and be able to uh, be out on the course and then with Arlen who's going to be you know, one of the front runners and just helping support someone that I'm just really excited about. It's just honestly an honor and really exciting. I mean this is the biggest race as far as ultras are concerned and just to be able to take in the course and be out there and kind of be part of the team is, is pretty awesome. To have the most stacked field in the entire nation all at the same place, racing at the same time, I think it's just going to be so much fun. I was pretty excited um, to know that the top endurance athletes in the world are here and to know that your buddy is right there with them. It's pretty exciting. So to be able to be out here with a guy that we care about and to have a horse in the field and to, to try to make him successful is, is really exciting for us. Arlen's the kind of guy where he's just so humble. As fast as he runs and as serious as he takes his racing, he will stop for a second to take a selfie with somebody and to say hi and keep on running. I've seen it in a few races. He doesn't act like he's bigger than the sport. He's just a very well-mannered, good-natured guy. And when he shows up, you know the other runners and, and, and spectators are, are gonna enjoy themselves when they meet him or get to talk to him. He's, he spends a lot of time before and after the race talking with people. Arlen's just a different breed. You know, he'll go out, run his race, and afterwards he'll go help others. But there was a race where he finished and then he was at the aid station later, like literally untying people's shoes and helping them with it. Like, who does that? Arlen does. I, as a dad, have known him from a little kid. And what I really appreciate about him is, is his integrity. And that he is a, a solid Christian. And I guess the one thing that really stood out several years back during COVID they had a, a race that they did virtual. And so he found out about it, I think after it had already started, but he signed up and you were to see how many miles you could run in that week. And at the end of that time period, why he found out that the, the start time was seven o'clock in the morning. Well, he had actually started at six. So he, on his own, dropped off the mileage before seven and it made him lose first place and nobody would have known but him but that's the kind of person he is and I, that to me is more important than him winning a race is being being honest i mean the running community already is better than other sports as far as being friends versus hating each other and competing against each other but i've been in in races where Arlen is faster than me and we're halfway through a 10k and instead of just turning and leaving me he'll he'll say well Derek you know I think I'm still on pace for a PR here I'm gonna go ahead and, and go out ahead or uh, the day that I set my personal best in the 5k I mean I think he was almost more excited than I was like he was really excited afterward and that that meant a lot to me that 
my friend, you know, cared about my running as well and not just about what he had done that day. I think my faith in God has been such a game changer. And I say that sheepishly because I think that so many people would like to think that if they can find anything to make them successful, they'll go for it. And yet, faith in God is not about success. It's more about our position with God. And it's so neat to be able to compete in a sport where, you know, it's everyone looks at your performance. And yet, knowing that I answer to a God that is going to be happy with me regardless of how I perform. And He's going to love me just the same. And there is a peace when I go to compete in a race that I don't have to perform well. And I can just go and enjoy it and have fun. And it's neat because I see so many athletes who find their identity in their performance. And it's so sad because I know they're not finding happiness or fulfillment in what they do as a profession. And I think it's such a dangerous lie that so many people believe that if they're just successful, they're gonna be happy. And that's so far from the truth because if you can't find your identity in Christ, you're gonna keep looking. And you're gonna probably keep looking in the wrong directions and the wrong things and the wrong places. And I think it's so neat to see how that, like I can enjoy a race regardless of how it goes. Arlen brings a lot to the running community. Can't wait to see how he finishes. Can't wait to see how he does. Just to, to watch a, an ultra race from from a crew inside, I guess, would be to see how he does. Just, yeah. I can't wait to tackle the challenges I'm gonna face. I love running in the heat, and there will undoubtedly be plenty of that going around uh, on race day. I think I will do well. I think that course will, will uh, complement my strengths. My focus is not going to be on outperforming someone else. It's going to be on me executing my plan to the best of my ability. And I have no idea how that's going to uh, stack up against the toughest guys in the world, but I can't wait to find out. Five, four, three, two, one. We took off and it felt like for the first mile, everybody went super slow. Like I think everybody's scared to take off and go for it. But you know, it starts at 5 a.m. till you get to the top of the escarpment, it's starting to get light. Pretty soon, some of them got brave and took off. And I was probably in 20th over the top of the escarpment. Got to the 18 station, was not a well-oiled machine at that point. I was glad I wasn't in need of much for the first 24 miles because it would have been challenging trying to figure that out. The level of difficulty to zigzag the mountain roads and get to the aid station and then there's a ton of action there and just, just trying to be ready when he gets there. Rolled into Duncan Canyon and things were, were warming up. Definitely had to pull out all the cooling gear and dial things in for, for the heat that was coming on already. After Robinson Flat, I didn't have as much confidence in my downhill legs, but probably should have taken it more aggressively. And it's all downhill for 10 miles, so it's a very fast section to get through. Dusty Corners is, was the last crew access before Michigan Bluff, I believe, and that's kind of where I screwed things up. Didn't realize how slow I would end up running that section. Got down to the river, and even though I I think I caught Tim Tollefson on the climb up Devil's Thumb and even I think I caught the two French guys on that climb as well. But it was just like that's where the wheels started to fall off. From Devil's Thumb to El Dorado Creek, you know, there's a bunch of downhill. So I was still running the downhill well. It was kind of after that that I had gone too long without taking in enough calories and that kind of plagued me for the rest of the race. It, it's something I kind of pulled out of, but it never, never left me completely. That's kind of when the cramping and the hamstring started and things just kind of started spiraling down. From El Dorado up to Michigan Bluff was kind of 
just like I can't figure can't figure out what's going wrong here. I was hiking every one of the climbs, was getting caught by runners. Just realized I was not having my day. I can remember at one point realizing that I probably wasn't even going to place in the top 10 at the rate things were going. But I remember thinking about watching Unbreakable where Jeff Rose lost his climbing legs early in the race and it felt just like that for me. And I can remember there being just this little glimmer of hope like maybe things will turn around for me. I think as I approached Michigan Bluff that's when it started dawning on me that you know I've been a long time without crew access and realized it was three hours I spent there without crew access and I had only taken a few calories during that time and it was just not enough so that's where I felt like things kind of started to turn in the right direction and so I really focused on getting a bunch of calories down between Michigan Bluff and Forest Hill but the cramping and the hamstring just kept coming back as every time I would try to push on the climbs it would remind me that it's uh, still down there what was really cool was watching him go from you know feeling a little down, down, double, double thumb, and then from 42 to 62, and right at 62, Forest Hill, he just starts taking off on the flats and downhills, and he was crazy in the downhills. We were going at 640, 630 pace for a few miles, you know, with the aid station stops, it might have, the splits might have been a little different, but we were cruising really fast. But you get up to, to Bath Road, and I remember I got up to Bath Road, and Jeff Browning was, was there waiting for someone to come up, and I was just telling Jeff like how how rough this is. I lost my climbing legs and Jeff's like, that's no problem. Like, <laughs> he's like, it's all downhill from here. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but I'm, you know, I'm cramping up and whatever. And he's like, that's, that's, it's hot out here. Like, that's just what happens. <laughs> so rolled into Forest Hill and surprisingly the, from taking in some calories was starting to feel pretty good. My crew was there and ready to really make a difference. They, I think they had realized that things were a little bit off and so they were ready to really make a difference. They changed my shoes and got me feeling just happy again. And it kind of dawned on me that I have a pacer now. Um, things are just gonna be different from here out. And so Owen Thornton was my first pacer. He picked me up at Forest Hill and took me to Rucky Chucky. We had quite an experience going down through there. I was starting to feel pretty good and, and a few of the guys that caught me during my death march, I was able to catch them right soon after Forest Hill and I was just feeling so good and I, I can remember they had just passed me and now I'm passing them and I kind of apologized to them. I'm like, sorry guys, but I have to run when I can. That section went pretty smooth down Cal Street, just focusing on looking at my chart and seeing how many miles it was to the next aid station, trying to figure out how I'm gonna stay cool between those aid stations and depending on the distance if it was three miles I knew I didn't need a lot if it was going to be six miles I needed to make sure I was full of ice and very cool when I left the aid station coming down getting close to Green Gate and I had the worst spell of cramping during the whole race just before I got to Green Gate and at one point I stopped to look back to see if Owen was still back there and my hamstring cramped up so bad I almost fell over and I couldn't I couldn't walk and I was trying to stretch it out and it hurt so bad to stretch it and I realized this is like this is bad this is I can't run anymore I can't even walk and I was trying to figure out how, to, how I was going to get going again and like trying to bend over to get that thing loosened up and I remember I crawled over to the top of the hill and I looked down and <laughs> the aid station was right there you know the river crossing and so I had to like suck it up and fake it down to the river, act like I wasn't cramping, try to run as normal as I could. I never knew from one step to the next if it was going to be my last. <laughs> Derek has paced me at Havelina, Canal Corridor, Mohican, and now Western States, and so he definitely knows my dark side better than anybody. He's helped me through a lot. He was really, really amped that I had worked my way from almost 10th place all the way up 4th place at that point. So he had a fresh mind and was ready to pull the best out of me. We got down to the aid station mile, I think like 85, and I'm at the aid station trying to cool off, getting my stuff together, and all of a sudden I hear some cheering and I look back 
and whoever was behind me at that point came into the aid station before I made it out and I was like, oh boy, <laughs> I might be in third place, but somebody is, somebody's nipping at the heels. And I just remember thinking like, wow, this is gonna be a long 15 miles. Torrey Road, it was kind of fun. I come down off the hill and I, I look up and I'm like, I've never met that guy, but that looks like Scott Jurek. And I come into the aid station and Scott's standing there and he's like, can we get you anything? And I'm like, are you Scott? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, well, yeah, how about a fist pump? <laughs> like, I'm just like having a fanboy moment here at 87 miles into the race, just like, chill, this is this is cool. But yeah, it was it was good to lift the spirits a little bit. And you know, I had I had suffered quite enough that day. And coming into there, it was like I was starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel. Like I was still in third place. I was, you know, looking at possibly making the podium and considering having, you know, just a day of, of uncertainty and, and unexpected difficult situations to work through. Um, when I come into Pointed Rocks, they were giving me a headlight and I said, no, I'm, I'm gonna finish this without a headlight. And I can remember kind of wrapping things up, thinking about, you know, it's time to probably get going and somebody yelled and said, hey, guy just came into the aid station behind you and they didn't tell me who it was. Well, I can remember just grabbing my the two bottles I had. I, I wasn't even sure at that point what I had, what I needed, just took off. And I knew if I had to make a move during Western States, that would be the place that I could make a move. So I was just running for all I was worth, knowing I was gonna have to hike back up into Auburn. Whoever this was behind me, if they could, if they could run the uphill, I was toast. And at one point, I kind of tripped and and my hamstring was cramping out and then I almost blew my knee out. And I remember not hearing any cheering behind me. And I can remember thinking, well, that's probably good because whoever that was behind me, they're probably far enough back that I can't hear them cheer for. Them. And I kind of had a bit of confidence at that point. But then before we got to Roby Point, climbing up the steep part, I can remember hearing someone right behind me and I was determined not to look back. Crawled up into up into Roby Point, and I can remember thinking, well, if I make it to Roby Point, then I've got this. And just as I crested the hill in mile 99, looking back just to make sure nobody was back there, and sure enough, I couldn't see anybody, and I figured, well, there's at least a two-minute gap. At that point, my crew was with me, and I told them to look back and make sure, you know, just let me know if anybody gets in sight. He knows what he's doing. You know, he's got his head screwed on straight for every race. You know, 99 miles on the legs, I had pulled together a pretty decent race. And I can remember thinking like, okay, all the hard work's in, now I'm gonna just enjoy it. And I'm not gonna like just sprint the last mile. I'm gonna just soak this up. This is Western States. I'm gonna give high fives. I'm gonna just have a good time. And I remember just rolling down through Auburn. And as we're getting close, I finally, the track gets in sight can see the track. Right then, somebody yelled, Tyler's right behind you. I was thinking, this is impossible. We had just rounded the corner. I knew if they could see Tyler, he, he was just a few seconds back. I knew they couldn't see for very far back. Instead of, you know, going around the track, having a big party, <laughs> it was just a dead sprint. I can remember, you know, turn to the left, the right, and then you jump through the gate, kind of in an angle, jumping through the gate, like, almost tripping and then I remember like kids crossing the track and like not, not trying my best not to plow anybody over and just running around the track just like the Grizzlies chasing me. It was such a relief to to get to the finish line and just like the excitement of realizing that I had someone licking my heels from 85 miles all the way around <laughs> around the track. All of a sudden I I kind of crashed once I hit the finish line and I can remember like laying on the track just gasping for air. Then I looked up to see if Tyler was back there and he had just rounded the corner. It was so fun to actually be able to stand up and go stand at the finish line and be like the first one to hike Tyler when he crossed the finish line. It was just so special. Most people it takes them years and years to get into Western States and then to like come away with a, with a a finish line experience like that was just something that I'll never forget. Yeah. Have any 
people that are, like that are like borderline on the sport, borderline interested in the sport, they're all posting things about look at Arlen, he got he got third place at Western States. Ohio is proud. They are so proud of Arlen. And I the thing is, is he also does it right. We, we've only we've only known Arlen for like a month, but we are just so ridiculously, ridiculously proud of him after Western States. Just get in and beyond. Yeah, incredible performance and still humbled by his experience and I hope that that's kind of the beginning for um, some more things to spiral for him. You know, when you're around him, you're, you're just instantly calm. Anything that you've been dealing with, any problems or burdens, they just seem to go away. And he's just like one of those magical people, man, that you can just talk to and just sink back and relax and be yourself. When you put your bib number on, you step out that morning. You just know that something bizarre is going to happen. And you don't know what that bazaar is going to look like. It could be it, it, any number of things could go wrong. And you just know that there is a humongous story waiting out there for you to go grab, you to go make. And, and you're, you're writing a story, and you're going to get to tell that story. And it can be quite a crazy tale sometimes. <laughs>